Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm John Corlett, the President and Executive Director of the Center for Community Solutions. It's my pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, David L. Dotson, the President of MDC. Mr. Dotson is here today to deliver the Eugene H. Friedheim Lecture as part of the Center for Community Solutions 74th Annual Human Services Institute. Mr. Friedheim was a prominent Cleveland attorney who, together with his wife, Mina, was an active in a number of Cleveland charitable organizations. He saw the Center for Community Solutions as having a key role as a planner and community convener. This lecture fund was established by his family and friends to extend his humanitarian influence into the future. We're grateful for the contributions made by the Friedheim family to Cleveland's future. Since President Lyndon Johnson launched the War on Poverty 52 years ago, Poverty in America has changed. According to the Pew Research Center, the nation's official poverty rate has declined from around 22% in 1960 to 14.5% in 2013. But despite these gains, however, communities of color and those located in the southern United States continue to be those most heavily impacted by poverty. The reason is the debilitating nature of deep poverty, poor nutrition, inadequate schools, and the cost of higher education. These are barriers that few can overcome. The answer to this challenge is equity, leveling the track so no one's climb is too steep. That's different from equality, which says that everyone is allowed at the starting line. Equity means providing those with the toughest climb the support they need to get there. But how do we get there? Our speaker today has some pertinent insights. For more than 40 years, MDC has been publishing research and developing programs focused on expanding opportunity, reducing poverty, and addressing structural inequality. Founded in 1967 out of North Carolina Governor Terry Sanford's North Carolina Fund, the original mission of MDC, then known as Manpower Development Corporation, was to design job training programs to help poor and displaced workers in the transition from an agricultural to an industrial economy, and from a segregated to an integrated workforce. Since then, the name has changed, and MDC has developed and implemented programs in areas including youth engagement, training and employment, community college improvement, rural and economic development, strategic philanthropy, workforce competitiveness, school reform, and grassroots community leadership. Since joining MDC in 1987, Mr. Dodson has directed major projects to increase student success in public schools and community colleges, address regional economic decline, strengthen community philanthropy, and build multiracial leadership across the South and the nation. As president of MDC since 1999, he has advised major philanthropic foundations on strategies to reduce poverty and reduce social disparities based on the premise that, quote, society benefits when everyone succeeds. Mr. Dodson received his bachelor's degree in architecture and urban policy from Yale University, a master's degree in ethics and theology from Yale Divinity School, and a master's degree in public and private management from the Yale School of Organization and Management. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club, please join me in welcoming David Dodson. Thank you so much. That was... Lovely. I think my mother wrote that. I don't, don't know how that came to be. It is wonderful to be here. I, ever since landing on the tarmac, I have felt just a tremendous spirit emanating from Cleveland. Um, it is so wonderful to be in a place that people are so proud of, and, um, and that just comes across to the visitor. Um, so I'm, I'm deeply honored to be with you, deeply honored to be at this most distinguished 
podium. And I must say, you know, um, to have the President of the United States and a championship um, baseball team just arrange to welcome a visitor from out of town <laughs> is, you really know how to, really know how to do it. <laughs> it's just incredible. So thank you. We're going to have a, um, I'm going to share some information with you today, and then um, after the formal remarks, I hope we'll have a conversation about um, mobility, economic mobility, and how we build the infrastructure of opportunity that is necessary to ensure that all people, all young people, are able to move as far as they desire and as society requires. Um, as um, John said in that lovely introduction, I'm from MDC. We're a nonprofit based in North Carolina. One of our board chairs said we are a think and do tank or a think tank with muddy boots. And we really try to take ideas and put them on the ground working with people in institutions and across society who want to see very different outcomes that are, in fact, equity-oriented. And I loved the definition of equity. Thank heaven. Wonderful. Equity and equality aren't the same things. Equity talks about um, a, the, what's needed to restore a balance, a fair balance in terms of opportunity and outcome. And when we were working once in Alabama with a small group, there was a woman who said, um, we were asking, said, how do you define equity? And said, well, I'm an accountant. And equity is what makes the balance sheet balance. And I've always loved that notion. So we'll talk about equity, we'll talk about mobility today, and um, why the infrastructure of opportunity is absolutely essential to having more people move on up. Now, if you're of a certain age, this title may speak to you. How many of you remember the TV show The Jeffersons? And you know that famous theme song, moving on up, moving on up. People moved up to the east side to the deluxe apartment in the sky. So we're going to talk about how we can have youth and young adults in Cleveland who were stuck at the bottom move up. So we're going to begin. This is lunch. You've had a lovely lunch. We begin with a quiz. Open book. How many of you believe that where a person starts out in life should not determine where they end up? Oh, that's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant <laughs> class. So thank you. This means I can finish the rest of my talk. <laughs> because if the answer had been otherwise, we would have had a problem. So if you believe that, as I do, and as I think most Americans do, um, what appeared on the front page of the New York Times about two years ago, about three years ago now, um, really should disturb us all, as it did disturb me. What you see if you're um, in the room or watching the, uh, the video is a map of the United States. And you see that um, a large part of the country is red, um, the part of the country where I live. And also, if you look up and locate Northeast Ohio and Cleveland, you see it's also reddish orange. What this map from the front page of the New York Times depicts um, are the results of a study by Professor Raj Chetty called the Equality of Opportunity Project. It was an exercise in big data where it looked at every person born between 1980 and 1985 in the United States and then calculated where they had fallen, where they fell on um, the income ladder by the time they were 30. It wasn't just a statistical sample. It was big data showing everyone how far they had moved from birth to young adulthood, from the income status of their family at birth to an end point. And where the map is red, it says that the movement up was most constrained for, young, for children born to the bottom 5% of the income distribution. Places that are red on this map say that the odds of rising from the top, from the bottom 5% to the top 5% were the steepest in the country. Think of the Horatio Alger story. You're able to move from the very bottom to the very top. Where the map is red, that's constrained. The map is constrained in the American South, where I come from, 
and in Northeast Ohio, where we are now. So to paraphrase um, that famous movie, um, Apollo 13, uh, not Houston we have a problem, but Cleveland we have a problem, Raleigh-Durham we have a problem, Atlanta we have a problem. Young people aren't moving on up. There is a fundamental and profound intergenerational stickiness at the bottom of the income ladder for children who are born at the bottom. They stay stuck generation on generation. And that contradicts the American dream of, of upward mobility. So let's define a few terms. I am not an economist. Um, I went to the Yale Divinity School. I learned a certain kind of economy, but not the kind that <laughs> generally translates. So when we talk about upward uh, economic mobility, we can talk about that as the average economic outcome for a child from a below-income family by the time they're an adult. Um, in the South, the compromised areas for economic mobility include some of our most vibrant communities, Atlanta, Charlotte, Raleigh-Durham, where I live. Raleigh-Durham, which was ranked by Forbes magazine as the best place for business in 2012, ranks 94th in terms of economic mobility among the 100 largest cities. So a rising tide does not automatically lift all boats when we look through the end of upward mobility. You can think about mobility by envisioning rungs on the ladder. Mobility describes the odds of a person moving from the bottom rung to a higher rung. And if the rungs are either far apart or the rungs are broken, that climb becomes harder. When we talk about inequality, which is a related term, and there's a lot of conversation about inequality, inequality speaks to where someone is positioned on the ladder, not the rate or degree of movement. So I want to talk today about mobility. How does someone at the bottom, born at the bottom, have a chance to move to a better place? Robert Reich, who was Secretary of Labor under President Bill Clinton, um, said something that was important. We're, we're mesmerized by inequality, but inequality would be somewhat less of a problem if mobility were stronger in America. If someone stuck generation on generation at the bottom without a chance of moving up, that's as profound a problem as, as inequality. So what I want to begin is with the statement that, a, that the lack of upward mobility represents a compromised American dream for young people born at the bottom of the income pyramid. And it contradicts that compelling magnetic belief that we began with that where a child starts out in life should not determine where she or he ends up. The map also points to something different, that because there are variations in mobility across the United States, what the map tells us is that place matters when it comes to upward mobility. Where a child grows up determines the odds of whether or not that child is able to get to um, an economically sustainable livelihood um, as an adult, income as an adult. Professor Chetty and his colleagues identified five factors that are closely associated with movement up on the mobility ladder from the time of birth to young adulthood. And I want to share those with you and talk a little bit about where Cleveland and um, Northeast Ohio sit. So the first factor is residential segregation. Mm -hmm. To a degree that a young person grows up in a residentially segregated area, segregated by race, but also segregated by income, educational attainment, and occupation. Mm -hmm. To the degree the host community is residentially segregated, it's harder for that young person to move up. Now, in recent data from Richard Florida, who has been a speaker here, I understand, at the University of Toronto, among metropolitan areas of a million or more, Cleveland ranks first among U.S. metropolitan areas in the percentage of its residents living 
in racially homogeneous zip codes. That is zip codes of like folks, racially. 71% of whites, 30% of blacks live in racially homogeneous zip codes. That isn't an automatic um, factor in shaping mobility, but this massive data study said it's a powerful contributing factor. Second condition is income inequality. If the rungs of the ladder are, fall ap are far apart, it stands to reason it's harder to move from the bottom to the top. And again, between 2012 and 2013, there were two cities where income inequality grew at statistically significant rates. One of them was Dallas. The other was Cleveland. The third factor that is closely associated with whether or not upward mobility exists from the bottom to the top is school quality, public school quality. Um, and by one measure, one measure of school poverty can be the number of students who are going to school in low-income schools, where 75% or more of children um, receive free or reduced lunch. So again, in the metro Cleveland area, 23% of all students attend high poverty schools. You may say, well, that's not too bad. 6% of white students are in high poverty schools, 56% of African American students, 54% of non of, of Latino students of all, of all races. So this is not to say that a high poverty school is automatically an inferior school, but there are plenty of data to suggest that high poverty, under-resourced schools function very often as less effective launching pads to success. Another factor contributing to upward mobility or the lack thereof is family structure. And here, um, I don't want to make comments about the morality of single or dual um, heads of household, but to make an economic point. According to the MIT Living Wage Index, what it takes for a, a household composed of a single adult and one dependent child to live, meet daily expenses, and to have a small saving surplus is a wage, hourly wage of $20.17. That's a pretty high threshold. That's about $40,000 a year. So imagine that. Very many jobs don't pay that amount of money, which means to get to that level, that adult single head of household either has to be satisfied by working more than one job or not to meet that threshold at all. So the real fact that for mobility's sake that we want to address with respect to family and household composition is the tax that's imposed on having a single earner household in a two earner economy. We can talk about that when we get to questions. And finally, and here's an important point, the fifth contributor to associated with low economic mobility is what's called social capital. And the best way to think about that, I think, is about the informal and formal networks that allow folks to understand where opportunity is and what the pathways are to navigate this. Robert Putnam has talked about this, William Julius Wilson, when he talks in his powerful book, now a classic, When Work Disappears, talks about what happened in traditional African-American neighborhoods where middle-class jobs, when middle-class jobs and middle-class workers exited the neighborhood. The role models were gone, and the cultural clues about how to navigate forward often went with them. So these five factors matter to mobility, and they are challenges for Raleigh-Durham, where I, I live, and their challenges for Cleveland. James Baldwin famously said, and we love to quote this at MDC, um, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So I think if we care about mobility, these five factors need to be faced. And I know many of you are working on these things. 
they truly matter to the problem. We call these the big five. They're your big five. So let's take a look briefly at economic mobility in Cleveland, what all this means. And I want you to focus just on the leftmost bar. What this says is the chances for a child raised in the bottom 20% of the income distribution, the chance that they will move forward to another quintile by the time they are an adult, based on that Chetty data. The far left bar says that for a child, a child born to a parent in the bottom 20% has a 39% chance of himself or herself ending up in the bottom as an adult. So normal distribution would be 20%, almost double the odds of staying at the bottom if you're born at the bottom in Cleveland. There's another 30% chance that you'll move up one economic quintile, not to the median economic, um, not to median income, but below median. Add up 39 and 30%. That's almost a 70% chance that a child born at the bottom won't even get to median income by the time they're an adult. When I talk about intergenerational stickiness at the bottom, these are what those numbers mean. So there's 729 economic commuting zones in the country where there's an economic center that's the, um, that's the economic hub of a region. So where does Cleveland rank in terms of upward economic mobility among the 729 uh, commuting zones in the country on a scale where one is the worst and 729 is the best? The Cleveland commuting zone ranks 37th out of 729, where one is the worst. I'm not just talking about Cleveland, because Charlotte, in my state, ranks 53rd. Raleigh-Durham is 85th. None of these numbers is particularly good. But, um, but the bottom 5% is, is where Cleveland is. We can also look at something, again, I said place matters to mobility something called the income penalty of growing up in a certain geography. This is sobering to me. A child born to a low-income family in Cuyahoga County would earn 3% less by age 26 than the national average for a 26-year-old. If that same child were born and lived and grew up in King County, Washington, Seattle, they would earn 11% more than the median. So place indeed mattered. Even more, if a child moved from Cuyahoga to King County, that child's income would rise. So clearly these outcomes are unacceptable, whether they're in Raleigh-Durham or Cleveland. I hope you'll agree. Now, you're going to say, what kind of rude person comes to a lovely lunch <laughs> and then dumps this stuff on us. So there is some good news. My job is to make you feel awful. And then, once the hammering stops, to make you feel really good. So let's look at, um, let's look very quickly at um, what changes the odds of moving up. There is data from another longitudinal study by the Pew Charitable Trust, somewhat different data set, but roughly the same methods, that say if a child born in that bottom fifth gets no college degree, they have a 47% chance of being stuck at the bottom. But here is the good news. If someone in that same position does get a college degree, and here we're defining college more narrowly as a four-year degree, that 47% chance of being stuck at the bottom goes to 10%. We go from double the odds to half the odds of being at the bottom. Whenever these data are explained, people say, that really, that's one of the most compelling numbers I've ever seen. You cut by, in, you cut in by 75% the odds of being stuck at the bottom if you can help someone, that person get a, in this case, a college degree. A post-secondary credential matters decisively to the prospects for upward mobility. 
Absolutely. It makes a fundamental difference. It doesn't help a post-secondary credential with labor market relevance doesn't just help someone beat the odds, it fundamentally changes the odds and changes the odds permanently. And as you can see from this, it dramatically changes opportunity across the income distribution. So everybody gets to a higher point on the mobility ladder if they have a post-secondary credential. These are enormously compelling data. So I, we'll talk in a second, and, and time is running a little loose. I just want to share with you what the work needs to look like for um, all of us who are concerned about getting young people on a mobility track. You'll see on this map there's some squares, some lozenges that talk about a path from preparation, connection, to entry and progress and completion of a post-secondary credential and ultimately making sure that once credentialed, a young person connects to family supporting employment. Helping all young people in Cleveland get on the path so that they are preparing for post-secondary success, taking the right courses in middle school and high school, getting work-based learning experiences, learning how to analyze, learning how to think critically, preparing for the kind of rigorous work that they will encounter in a post-secondary ed education. That preparation is an essential first step. Preparation isn't enough because there has to be connection to a post-secondary institution. Mm -hmm. Visits to campuses for children who grow up in experiential isolation opportunities to, um, if possible, take dual enrollment courses so that in high school they are actually doing college level work. All these things prepare young people who, particularly those who are at the bottom, for the opportunity to get to the next step, entry into a post-secondary institution, then progression semester to semester, year to year, so that a young person gets a credential two-year, four-year labor market certification that has value in the labor market and that can unlock a living wage. And then comes the golden fleece. It's connecting to family-sustaining employment. There are people in this room, much of MDC's work is trying to figure out how do we build what we call talent development systems that deliberately connect young people who are growing up in isolation and disadvantage to the pathway to a credential that will unlock living wage work. That really is what will change those mobility outcomes. Before we end, I want to share a story. Every family has a mobility story. I want to tell you very briefly the story of Lillian and Norris. Lillian and Norris' story is no exception. It sheds light on the universal and the unique elements of the American dream. Both Lillian and Norris, whom you see here, were grandchildren of African Americans who escaped the cruel grip of racism in the antebellum South. Lillian's grandfather twice attempted escape from slavery in Richmond, Virginia, only to be recaptured. After the third attempt, his owners got the drift and they reluctantly allowed him to buy his freedom. He hightailed it to the Underground Railroad, got to Canada, put his skills in bricklaying and carpentry to work, started a business, began a family, and nurtured in them a spirit of ambition and possibility that was born of a new freedom. One of his sons graduated college at Wilberforce, kind of down the road here in Ohio, and his oldest granddaughter, the oldest granddaughter of that thrice escaped slave, Lillian, became the first woman in her family to graduate from college at Fisk University, that legendary Nashville institution established to prepare descendants of former slaves for leadership and service. Armed with a fresh degree in 1908, she left for Detroit, which was the Silicon Valley of industrial America, to teach the next generation of her people. 
Norris was the grandson of a free man of color from Richmond, whose son, Norris's father, migrated to Washington, D.C., which was then a far better place for African Americans to thrive. Norris was fortunate to attend school at the first public high school in America established for African Americans, Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, another Ohioan, where the faculty was composed of college-educated blacks who could only, whose only option for using their degrees was to teach high school. Dunbar was suffused with a culture of possibility that spurred ambition and academic improvement. It gra accomplishment. It graduated generals, scientific pioneers, a U.S. senator, civil rights leaders, and numerous professionals. At Dunbar, Norris caught the college-going bug. His teachers counseled more preparation, however, to reach a top-tier college. So through social networks, remember social capital? Through social networks, Dunbar faculty arranged for Norris to, to attend a final year of preparation at Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, premier proving ground for the male elite of the day. And from there, Norris went to the University of Michigan, paying for college by cooking on the train, cooking meals on the train between Washington and Detroit. He graduated as a chemist, sought opportunity in Detroit, ran into Lillian, they got married, and that was the story. Now you may say, why do you talk about these people? Because they are my grandparents. And so I think they, so everybody has a mobility story. So let's just look before we close and go into discussion. What are some of the factors that advanced Norris and Lillian? They had personal drive. They were nurtured by a culture of aspiration and urgency within both their family and their community. Their family knew there was something better and sacrificed to get them there. They benefited, and I think this is so important, from launching pad institutions that developed in them confidence and skill. How many of our institutions are true launching pad institutions? Let's think about that. They participated and connected to an economy that generated opportunity for educated people. That's what they benefited from. Now, what prevented others like Norris and Lillian, they were the talented, lucky few, from advancing. There was not a prevailing cultural and political commitment to racial justice and equity. It held most people back. Norris and Lillian were the exceptions. There was not what we call a strong infrastructure of opportunity, a set of pathways and supports deliberately constructed to move people from the bottom to the top. There was an episodic, there were episodic pieces of an infrastructure for Norris and Lillian, but not a systemic, deep, and pervasive infrastructure of opportunity. There was not supportive public policy that could take a few examples and lift them to be universal. In fact, public policy was deliberately discriminatory and discriminatory and um, and focused on distinctions on limiting mobility rather than advancing to it. And there are no doubt other factors that you would add. So the stories of Norris and Lillian speak to universal elements, personal drive, the critical value of launching pad institutions, the absolute essential nature of an inspiring, motivating environment, and the fact of economic payoff. But it also underscores what happens if we don't have systemic reinforcement in public policy, in culture, in systems that make an individual set of examples a universal truth. So I'm going to end here. I think our clock is winding. I've got more to say in Q&A. And I hope we'll have more to talk about collectively. But the points I want to leave you with are these. It is truly unconscionable that we have intergenerational stickiness at the bottom of the income distribution. That is contrary to American ideals and to the American dream. The factors that keep that in play are cultural factors 
that we all have the ability to influence through the various avenues of action that are available to us. Um, we also know, um, with, it's incontrovertibly true, that a post-secondary credential that can prepare people for living wage employment decisively changes the mobility prospects for people born at the bottom, decisively. And we know through example that personal drive and family support is critical, as they were to Norris and Lillian, <laughs> but that nothing can be done without launching pad institutions, supportive public policy, and the elimination of structural barriers that get in the way of people moving forward. So I hope we can talk about that. We have a little time for Q&A um, in the afterwards. I want to share, if we can, a little of what you're doing already in Cleveland to help move young people forward and what more needs to be done. But I hope you will leave here um, with a commitment to saying when the map of America is shown 30 years hence, Northeast Ohio will no longer be red. I hope the South won't either, but we'll, <laughs> we'll begin at home. And um, I know that the spirit of, that is alive in this community, if turned to these problems of mobility, can change the color on the map. So thank you very, very much. Wow. OK. Uh, today we are enjoying a Friday Forum with David L. Dotson, President of MDC. We're about to begin the audience question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students. For those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, webcast, or our new live simulcast at the Parma Snow Branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library, if you'd like to tweet us a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try and work it into the program. We want to remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point, and actually questions. Holding the microphones today are content coordinator Teddy Eisenberg, who I saw over there, and director of programming Stephanie Jansky. May we have the first question, please? Can I come up here? Okay. All right. Yes. Previous speaker here at the City Club was Eugene Lang, uh, philanthropist from New yes. York. You're familiar with him, yes, thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, his point when he committed to provide college education for the graduating class at the sixth grade at PS, whatever it was, mm -hmm. was the realization that it took a tremendous effort to get these kids through school. You can't have a secondary, you can't have post-secondary degrees if you don't have a high school education. Absolutely. What programs or what means would you advocate Lang's was that he hired two full-time social workers to work with 30 kids for the next six years. That's what it took to get, I think it was 27 of those kids then went on to college. How do we get the kids through high school? Yeah, thank you. That's, that, it's an important question. I would say there are many things. What Mr. Lang was doing, um, social supports and reinforcement of aspirations is critical. If you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel or don't believe that the light can ultimately shine on you, it's very likely you'll aspire to the finish line. I think that's true. So cultivating aspirations and expectations is really important. Making sure there is instructional excellence in the classroom and not a double standard. So I have a great friend, Lorraine Monroe, who ran um, the Frederick Douglass Academy, a special school in Harlem. And she said, I'll tell you the Monroe Doctrine. She was Lorraine Monroe. I'll answer these four questions, and I'll build a school that works, a high school that works, as you're saying. Number one, what did high school do for you that allows you to sit in this room today, able to read, write, think, and compute? What did school fail to do for you that you wished it would? What do the best private schools do that people are willing to spend tens of thousands of dollars a year um, for their children to go? And what would you want for your own child? She said, answer those four questions, and I will build, be able to build you a school around it. And she built a high-performing school in Harlem. But the point is academic rigor. I think the cultivation of 
aspirations and expectations that are then grounded in an academic program that seems to have reality. Um, and then I think exposure to the light at the end of a tunnel. So what happens, high school, I mentioned Dunbar High School that my grandfather went to. That was a launching pad institution that took people who were African American at the early part of the 20th century from all different kinds of backgrounds. The teachers were inspired. They had relentless standards. They demanded ac academic excellence, and they found a way to, it, to show young people what the ultimate payoff was. So I think that's really important. I would also say that what, has to ha what happens in high school needs to, as we all know, begin much earlier. Um, and the community, the culture, and the family these are not easy things, need to reinforce those aspirations that a good high school will cultivate. So I hope that's partially an answer. What Also what Mr. Lang did, and there's a lot of evidence about this, is simply helping young people even de begin to develop and save small amounts of money so that the financial hurdles that are perceived and real about even going to college seem less great. So. I think it's excellence in instruction. There's, there's, there's no substitute for that. Mentoring, cultivation of aspiration, showing the light at the end of the tunnel, working with the family unit so that everybody is building that launching pad um, culture. Those are some of the elements. And I think just because that's a laundry lift of hev list of heavy lifts, this sort of <laughs> explains why it's all so hard. But um, Again, what got us all to this room able to read, write, think, compute, and do well, it was all those <laughs> factors. And we simply have to put them in place um, again. And we're in a time of fundamental rebuilding. Place matters. So um, it, is, it is our job, wherever we live, to try to construct those preconditions that, that we're talking about. That was a long answer. You didn't say the answers had to be short. You just said the, but it was a very, it's a very important question and thank you for, for asking it. So Jody Mitchell, and I have a question because uh, to follow up what you just um, responded to, I attended a Gen Youth Conference recently with Youth Empowerment around health and wellness and how children are improving the health and wellness of their educational institutions to make them better learners. And the national youth who was an ambassador said, all my peers say that the American dream is not possible. And it really stunned all the CEOs at the table to even hear that. And I think your, your cultivation, how do we cultivate cultivate that, how do we communicate that? Because we have sort of language barriers and communication barriers. How do we communicate it to our youth that the American dream is indeed possible using those programs you referenced? Well, um, it's, it, gets, it gets communicated, I think, by demonstrated proof points, um, more with more with evidence and proof and less with words. Um, the reason I'm pausing is that uh, earlier this year, one of my colleagues at work was brutally beaten and left really for dead in the parking lot next to our office, um, which is in downtown Durham, an industrial city that's going through a resurgence. There are construction cranes everywhere. It turned out that three adolescent young men from a depressed part of Durham had bludgeoned him to rob him of his wallet and cell phone. Um, it, was a, it, was, it was stunning to nearly lose a colleague. It, his wonderful reaction was even more stunning once he recovered because he said, what would have driven three young people to have done this thing. And we all, here we were in MDC, an organization committed to pathways to talent development. And we began to talk about this. And we simply said, you know, a middle class person comes into this city and they see cranes and restaurants and people smiling. And we see ourselves as part of the narrative of success. These young people see those same things and they might have well been cranes and restaurants on the moon. They are, 
They are experientially and culturally irrelevant. And we began to say, you know, what if I don't even see myself in the, in the community's narrative of success? Why on earth would I aspire to connect to the pathways that we're constructing? So I think, and I don't have an answer to this, I'd love to hear what others of you say. I think we have to find very, very concrete ways of demonstrating very early to young people of all kinds that the pathway is real, that it is for them, and that society needs their constructive role to continue to evolve. When I was a little boy, I grew up in Washington. My favorite childhood photograph is of, it, excuse me, it was the late 50s, so you've got to get over this. It was me and my little shorts, and I think I have a little, it was like a beanie cap on. It was like a yarmulke, an African-American yarmulke. It didn't have a little thing on it. but it, And I was in little shorts and a little jacket, and I was holding my parents' hands, and we were all dressed up, and I, want, and I asked, well, where was this picture taken? And it was at the Howard University graduation. And I asked my parents, well, I don't think we had any relative who, she said, no, you, David, that wasn't the point. In the African-American community in Washington, everybody went to the Howard University graduation. And we took our children. So this is a picture of you at age three in your little kind of Buster Brownish yarmulke <laughs> kind of thing, whatever this clothing was. Because my mother was a, my mother was a teacher. Um, she, she, basically, she didn't use these words, but she said it was important from day one that you see the community celebrating together and that you see that this could be an not only could be, what was your expected destination. So I think part of this idea of, of how do we not only name aspirations but make them concrete through experience um, is, is really part of the, is part of the answer. And it, it has to happen. On the list of five factors that, that um, Professor Chetty's team looked at, I think the most important, actually, is the one at the end, which is social capital. And everyone's going to say, oh, that's soft, that's mushy, what does it mean? No. If you are experientially isolated, if you cannot even see that there is a tunnel or, a, a, or one with a light at its end, why on earth would you aspire to anything constructive or better. So I really think this idea of cultivating concrete expressions that the narrative applies to every child and that every child is necessary to a better outcome for society. I told, this is, I'm, you know, I'm a bad answerer because <laughs> I just like, you, you said keep your question short. Didn't say keep your answer short. I hope, I hope that is somewhat helpful. And these are intangibles, but think about the ways in which each of us can cultivate aspirations and expectations in somebody who has a foreshortened sense of their own possibility. It is, we ent- call it mentoring, call, we have institu- we, th- this is... This is what it is. I was going to end with a quote um, that my boss, the founder of MDC, used to, he said it was from H.G. Wells. I think he made it up and attributed it to H.G. Wells. But, but the quote is, all human history is a race between education and catastrophe. And I really do think that is true. We're not doing, so, I mean, catastrophe is kind of starting to pull ahead a bit here. Um, we... <laughs> We've got to figure out what will, what will induce the aspirational behavior in young people as we adults provide the supports to get them to those aspirations. That, that's, what, that's what our work is, it seems to me. Referring back to the map you had up at the beginning, Northeast Ohio was red and North Dakota was blue. Would you explain the North Dakota blue? Okay. <laughs> So that's a that's a wonderful question. Um, the 
Are there a lot of rural areas and remote areas that are blue? And remember when we said mobility was about the how, you could, how easily one can move from up the rungs of a ladder? In some, North Dakota's interesting, and the whole state was, was blue. Um, first of all, they, they had, at the time when this snapshot ended, the shale, oil, fracking, all of those economic opportunities that actually provided a large kind of income boost for people who were young and entering the labor market. But traditionally, in rural areas, the ladder is compressed. <laughs> So it's actually easier to move from the bottom to a better place because the rungs are somewhat closer together. So you may get to the top rung, but in some places the top rung isn't much higher than the middle rung someplace else. One of the best places for opportunity was a little town in, in the coal mining um, <coughs> districts of West Virginia. But that's a case where there just was the, the bottom, the top was, the top was shrinking, so it made it a little easier to move up. So there are, there are tricks in these, in these data to look behind the scenes. Um, it's, so I think that partially explains why North Dakota was blue. North Dakota, though, also had, a, had historically a very high rate of... Um, high school graduation. Not so much post-secondary attainment, but very high rates due to a, a much more homogeneous culture across most, most of the state, and um, just a cultural persistence that you needed to get a high school degree. So high school graduation rates have always been very strong there, so it's probably a combination of factors. I hope that... that it, by the way, the equality of opportunity database is, is utterly fascinating. Go in there and play with it and you will learn and see just a whole bunch of, whole bunch of stuff. So just talking in terms of upper mo mobility and education, uh, we've talked a lot about academic support from within the school system, yes. but I think a lot of stuff happens at home and I think that that's something that We've struggled a lot with in Shaker. Mm -hmm. We're from Shaker Heights, so woo. Uh, but uh, I think that that's something we've struggled a lot with is parental engagement. So how do you suggest that we approach parental engagement? Because I think it's hard to well, go and impose. In some, it's, first of all, I am really glad. This, this table over here is a table from Shaker Heights High School who are working on issues of um, race and racial equity and as I said when I heard they were here they really ought to be up here and I ought to really be sitting back there so I'm really I'm happy you are generating young people who really care and are and are asking questions and working on these things um, I do think the I do think home matters and because the the home cultures of so many young people are so so fundamentally different um, I think what you say poses an enormous challenge. Um, I mentioned that uh, for uh, a, a living wage for a single head of household with one dependent child was $20 an hour in Northeast Ohio, and how unlikely it would be that a single head of household in many households could earn $20 an hour or $40,000 a year, meaning that head of household is probably working two jobs, leaving very little time to be at home with their child. So um, I think in households that are fortunate enough to be um, economically secure, um, again, this idea of cultivating expectations and aspirations and exposure is really important. I think the problem we're talking about here in terms of economic mobility is what do you do where there are, number one, economic stresses in the household that don't leave a lot of time for parents to provide guidance and inspiration as they might like to. Or two, when you have the compounding effect of families where adults have never even seen what the opportunities are and find it very hard to transmit that to children. So um, I think, um, I think, we should, um, I think community institutions can help households that are in stress 
supplement what they do in mentoring and guidance. The Lilly Endowment, um, which is based in Indianapolis, we did a lot of work with them now about 25 years ago on strategies for academic and career guidance in school and also in the community. And community institutions, boys clubs, girls clubs, the kind of places that young people find themselves often in, especially after school, can reinforce what the home does or supplement what a home can't do. Um, and so I think, I think those kinds of community institutions plus the family plus the school that this gentleman met all have to work together to cultivate aspirations. Last thing, and I know we're about to end, the, one of the pieces of work the Lilly Endowment did 25 years ago was a wonderful study called High Hopes, Long Odds. And they surveyed across the state of Indiana boys, girls from urban and rural backgrounds, African American, white, I think, and Latino, all income levels. And what they found out was for all groups, aspirations started very high. Aspirations mean I want to be a doctor, I want to be the president. But as time went on, expectations began to drop for poor families, families of color, rural families. In other words, I may have wanted to do that, but do I really think I can achieve that thing I want? And then finally, for many groups, actual achievement tailed off even more. So what we have to do is find ways to have aspirations translate into expectations, self-belief, and then translate into achievement so we really get the goods to, 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 um, to move up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David Dodson. We are enjoying our Friday Forum here at the City Club. I'm Dan Malthrop, just here to close you out. Mr. Dodson was delivering the Eugene H. Friedheim Lecture, which is sponsored by the Center for Community Solutions as part of their 74th Annual Human Services Institute. We're deeply grateful for the support of the Center. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Today's forum is also the David Warshawski Memorial Forum, endowed by Florence Warshawski, David's wife. Several members of the family are with us today, and we're told by them that, in fact, David Warshawski and Eugene Friedheim used to golf together occasionally or frequently, so um, they are together again. Um, additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by the Higher Education Compact, students from Shaker Heights High School, student group on race relations. Student participation in City Club Forums is made possible by grants from several foundations, including the Lobb Foundation. We thank all of you for being here. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you very much, Mr. Dodson. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your questions, your participation, and your presence. And uh, finally, go Tribe. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.